Hey folks, David Stewart here. I'm going to do something I haven't done for a little while on the channel, and that is talk about a movie, because I happened to see one in the cinemas. That is Puss in Boots, The Last Wish. Yes, a kid's movie. I saw it with my son, and it was overall pretty entertaining. What I was surprised by was that a lot of people seem to really like this movie. A lot of my mutuals and just normies out there seem to have really enjoyed this movie and to be surprised how much they enjoyed it. And this says to me a couple of things. First of all, this is from the Shrek franchise, which historically has produced a lot of successful movies that people enjoy. So it shouldn't be too much of a surprise that the Puss in Boots movie is also going to be um, a lot of fun for people to watch. But I think people are also starved for just competent movies in general. And this movie, I didn't think it was great, but it was certainly competent. And that's enough these days for people to think, well, this is a really good movie. Now, this is not going to be a by the numbers review. I might do that in a separate video if you want to hear my thoughts on the production elements of the story and how everything kind of fits together as a film. Really, I just wanted to talk about the story and how certain things, certain story techniques they used ended up paying off big time. This is a character driven movie. This is not a movie where the plot as some sort of um, thing unto itself is very substantial. The plot is pretty basic and really it's a MacGuffin that's there to solve an internal character conflict. So most of the conflict occurs within characters and between characters, not so much like a big problem to solve in the world. So the main conflict is of course with Puss in Boots who, if you've seen the trailer, you get the big conflict presented to you. He's out of lives. So cats have nine lives. He is onto his last life and that's a problem because he usually lives this very fearless and daring lifestyle where he's not worried about dying and being on his last life, now he's worried about dying. So the first thing that happens after he uh, gets told he's on his last life is he denies that it's a problem and then he runs away scared from a bounty hunter. Turns out to be death, of course, like literally the personification of death. He looks like Malthiel from... Uh, Diablo 3 with the twin sickles uh, chasing him. So it's pretty obvious that he's death and he symbolically represents death. And of course the uh, Puss in Boots is fleeing from death. And there's some comical scenes. So after we introduce that conflict, we have to get some more characters involved for the comedy to happen. And so the first one we meet is uh, Perro or Perrito, depending on what part of the movie you're looking at, uh, what he's called. He's just a little Chihuahua dog. His, of course, conflict is that he's oblivious. Um, he's he's oblivious to, I guess, how other people feel about him, but he really just wants a friend. He wants to belong somewhere. So that's his internal motivating conflict. Um, then the third big character you meet is Kitty Softpaws, and she is a romantic interest for Puss in Boots. Now, what's very interesting about her is that they used a very old storytelling technique, which is rather than trying to establish a new romance for one of your A, B, or C stories, you just have the romance already exist. They're old lovers that have known each other in the past, and now they have to reconcile and fix the problem with their relationship. So you get an automatic inbuilt conflict. You know, they don't get along, but obviously they still have feelings for each other because they used to have this romance. Um, one of the examples that you can think of if you're trying to think of this technique is Raiders of the Lost Ark. Um, when Indiana Jones meets the, the female love interest, of course, they have it's an old flame, like they have a past. So it saves a lot of time when you use that. If you have them having already had a relationship, then it's very quick to reestablish that relationship and create a conflict of, we have to get these two together, they have to rekindle their romance and figure out their problems, um, and then matriculate, rematriculate their relationship. So we find out, of course, that City Kitty Softpaws and Puss in Boots we not only had a prior relationship, but they were going to get married, and he stood her up in the altar. So the big theme for him for the movie is fear, and he was afraid of committing and getting married. But it's okay because she didn't really show up either. That's a good little, uh, good little detail because then we don't uh, completely denigrate the main character Puss in Boots and make him like a, a, a worthless scoundrel uh, because the bride also was not going to show up. So they're both kind of equally guilty and they're on the same footing as far as their relationship goes. So we don't really, we don't feel like Puss in Boots is not a good character um, because Kitty, Kitty Softballs has her own problems. They both have to solve their problems to solve the conflict. Now, as far as antagonists go, I mentioned Death. He's not so much a, a really present antagonist as just 
the force. He's just a force of death chasing Puss in Boots and forcing him to react. The only real antagonist is Jack Horner. And I love him as an antagonist because within the, the dialogue of the movie and the actions of the movie, they really point out what a contemptible and irredeemably evil character he is. And there's even this series of jokes. Um, and I think Paul Mullaney does the voice and he does the voice really well for this character. His delivery is really spot on to, to give you this goofy villain. Um, he was, of course, a little little boy, little Jack Horner who stuck his thumb in the in the pie or whatever. And he's he's angry that he's not like a more famous character, but he really has no reason to be evil. He points it out like all I did was you know have a successful inherit a successful pie selling business for my parents and you know acquire all these magical order artifacts and have a giant company where lots of people look up to me. He has no reason to be evil. He's evil because he's evil. And that's actually really refreshing. It's actually very refreshing to have a villain where you don't spend a bunch of time trying to explain why they're bad because they had a bad childhood or they it, it, they make it a joke that he, of course he didn't have a bad childhood. He had an intact, came from an intact family, a loving family, inherited a business. Everything was set up for him. And he came out uh, not just evil, but like really evil to where he doesn't care about anybody dying. He's a complete sociopath. Uh, he lets his henchmen just die off one by one. He does not care about anyone but himself. Uh, now the main MacGuffin for the solution to Puss in Boots' problem is this wish that they can go wish upon this star that fell from earth he can wish for the rest of his lives back which will make him which will repair his fallen status um, and get him back to where he needs to be where he can have nine lives and can live a fearly uh, a fearless and daring lifestyle of course jack horner wants it simply because he wants it because he wants a wish that will uh give him whatever he wants he's collecting magical artifacts he wants the power he wants the wish that's all we need to know about him and he's the force that is trying to stop puss in boots of course they steal the map from him and this is where you realize that the, the main macguffin of the film like we're going to get this wish to solve the problem you have a couple of characters who show up they have stolen the map for uh horner but we don't really know who they stole it from we don't know who they stole it from how they stole it why they stole it for money when this wish will give you whatever you want Presumably, if you stole it, you would just use it on yourself and wish for infinite money or something like that. So why they would sell it to uh, Horner doesn't really make a whole lot of sense or who they stole it from. Um, it's really just to set in motion some sort of solution to Puss in, Puss in Boots' problem. Uh, uh, something that he can do. He can take an action as the protagonist to solve his problem. And that action is going to be, I'm going to steal this map and I'm going to use it to get the wish. Now, originally, he's hired again by... Uh, not really an antagonist, but kind of a C-level um, secondary set of characters that really are doing a lot of pro-tagging. That's Goldilocks and the Three Bears. These cockney characters with um, kind of like a little gang of criminals uh, that are going to get the wish because simply because Goldilocks wants it. And Goldilocks reveals that she wants it because she wants to wish for her family back. She doesn't like being in a family of bears. And the bears are heartbroken about this. So their internal character conflict really comes from uh, the reality that the bears are treating her as if she feels the same about them that you know that they do about her, and they have to kind of reconcile that relationship. Relationship. So most of the conflicts are between the characters and about um, fixing relationships. You know, Puss in Boots has to reclaim his old life, and. Um, in true form, rather than having him use the wish to get his lives back, he comes to accept that he has only one life to live and that even though he's very afraid of losing his life, he's not going to act in a way that is uh, going to be fearful. Um, Puss in Boots has anxiety attacks and stuff throughout the, the story to, to really kind of bring that in that he has to fix his attitude about life rather than simply get more lives to continue living his kind of hedonistic way. And by accepting that he has that one life to live, that also allows him to repair his relationship with Kitty Softpaws. The repair of their relationship helps him to see the value of that one life. So kind of a classic A, B story. So your B story helps solve the problem of the A story. And then the C story is really Goldilocks and the Three Bears. And they come to the same resolution that they need to accept 
who they are and uh, the actual love that they have for each other and, and not kind of hold on to the past, trying to reclaim something that they've lost along the way, just kind of accept where they are. Um, so that's the big, um, the big story points. It's really very character driven and the characters are generally really likable. And that's why I think so many people have enjoyed this movie. And you can use these techniques in all of your stories as well. To have a character be anxious, they have to have something that's worth losing. And in this case, it is his very life. But more than his life, it's who he is as a daring outlaw. Uh, he, Puss in Boots, loses his identity. Um, and that's something that you can have. What is something that's integral to a character's identity that they could lose and have to recover? Is it like their ability to play music or their ability to do something? And how do they come to terms with the, the loss of that? You can imagine a musician getting ALS like, um, um, like Becker, um, who's a famous guitar player, and um, could no longer play guitar after he got ALS. Well, that is a really big impact on like your identity. How do you go forward from that? Those are conflicts that I think can have a lot of deep meaning in, um, in stories. Likewise, you can use old relationships that have to be repaired. That's a great conflict that you can have between characters. You can have the conflict of Pero, uh, uh, Perito, who, how do you find someone who loves you? How do you find people that care about you for you? Um, you just want to be loved and accepted. That's a that's something that is really identifiable and um, is a great motivator for a lot of characters. Um, and all of those ones, including like you know accepting uh, the current situation with the Gold of the Glocks and the Three Bears are a great contrast to a villain that's completely nihilistic and uh, just sociopathic, just really doesn't care about anything or anyone, and um, is a true, completely evil villain. And then you have this other character like Death that's really more of a force. He just kind of does what he's supposed to do and is only turned back at the end by his own attitude changing where he's like, well, I'm not going to try to kill you, Puss in Boots, because you've shown me that you actually value your life and I was angry at you because you didn't value your life. It's not so much that Death is the character that changes his mind. It's that Puss in Boots changes himself and so he no longer needs to fear Death in a, in a metaphorical sense. So all of those are great, are great conflicts and can be used and they're very competently executed even if like the MacGuffin for the story doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. And it sets up a lot of action for comedy. You know, if you have somebody who likes to be alone and somebody who's just looking for friends, it's a great, you know, comedy duo. Um, and that works pretty good throughout the movie as well. So anyway, if you saw it, leave me your thoughts down below in the comment section. I could say a lot more things about production and things like that, but I thought I'd just stick to the story for this video because that's where I, um, I think most people are most interested and that's where the quality of the movie is really going to shine is in those character interactions. So have a great one and I'll see you guys next time. Newest book is all Shafalda. Oh, I actually have the books near me today. All Shafalda, this fantasy tragedy and then um, Afterglow Generation Y. So these are the two books from the second half of 2022. Go ahead and grab those. More books will be coming out. So sign up at dbspress.com slash list to... Uh, I don't know about their release and probably get some free ones coming up here. So have a great one and I'll see you all next time.